Many folks wonder if our civilization will ever reach utopia and satisfy all our wants and needs, but just as many people wonder if trying to do so might itself bring about the fall of our civilization. A lot of discussion of the future tends to revolve around the notion that technology has the potential to bring us into a golden age where everyday needs like hunger are vague memories of the past. This is often called a post-scarcity civilization, and it's a blanket term for a point where civilization has such abundance that many of our problems just go away. A few months back, I was asked what the future would be like if this never came to pass, and a poor of the audience said there was a lot of interest in this scenario, so I thought we would explore it today. Though at the same time, a lot of our discussion is going to be how this fate isn't likely and that post-scarcity is where we are headed, and sooner than later. Now, we need to start by acknowledging a problem. There's the basic concept of post-scarcity, and there's the way the channel defines it for ease of discussion. Technically, a post-scarcity civilization is one in which there is no scarcity of any resource and even ignoring that we live in a finite universe, we usually view this as impossible, as certain things will always be scarce. For instance, only a finite number of people could have beachfront villas in Florida, or own Action Comics No. 1, or an original by Rembrandt. Extending this to what's possible for any individual person to do, how many people can be star NFL quarterbacks, or pop stars and so on. We can be inventive by employing options like virtual reality, or even altering folks' minds to not desire to be collectors or to be famous. This would be more like a post-discontent society, our dark mirror version of post-scarcity, where people are simply not discontent, even if starving in slums, because we brainwashed them or addicted them to a drug. Instead though, we opt to redefine post-scarcity for discussion on the channel as a multi-level affair and one based on common needs of humans that are really fulfilled in some way, as opposed to simply infinite access to raw materials or energy. This we can discuss, and the possibility it might not come about, whereas the basic post-scarcity of infinite abundance is very unlikely to ever come to pass anyway. We typically use Maslow's hierarchy of needs for this purpose as the most well-known example of listing human needs. Some, like having enough air to breathe to stay alive, are cases where we are already post-scarcity, but really for any given need, what people really mean when discussing post-scarcity and using it as a synonym for utopia is a feeling of abundance or stability of supply, to the point it eliminates anxiety about having it for most everyone. Whether it's a simple biological need like sleep or clean water, or something more existential like a feeling of purpose, a civilization can be post-scarcity in a given want or need, but not in another. Indeed, sometimes a civilization can be quite deprived in one need while being abundant in another. Pioneers living in log cabins were wanting for many things, but they rarely wanted for a feeling of purpose, for instance. Meanwhile, many wealthy and educated people have languished in that regard while having an abundance of other needs. Let's keep that in mind for today, because while I feel a post-scarcity civilization is a good thing and an achievable place, It is not some singular or utopian destination, and the future can still be pretty awesome without it, especially in every category. After all, I tend to feel our world is already pretty awesome, and there are relatively few places where we are post-scarcity, either by geography or category. But we should be mindful of those in which we are. I pointed out air, which amusingly probably had better quality for breathing centuries ago than now though not inside most actual homes, which were frequently heavily laden with smoke and mold spores. There are other more recent ones too, like clean drinking water or access to information. If you are hearing me speak right now, either in our video or on the podcast version of this episode, then it means you have access to more information than any living being ever had before you, and we are basically post-scarcity there. Also a society once post-scarcity is not necessarily eternally so, A river might dry up, removing previous water abundance for a place, a fertile valley might be mismanaged so it no longer produces as much food as it used to, or the population might simply have risen. So post-scarcity isn't necessarily an eternal state for some category once reached, the way that curing cancer or polio simply removes the problem. 
Alternatively, I'm not sure civilization could ever be post-scarcity on sleep or free time. I remember being deployed to Iraq during the war and having multi-month periods where I just never had enough time to sleep or relax, and that was on the heels of my time in grad school, which was low on sleep and free time and high on stress too, indeed in some ways it was sometimes worse than the war zone. I've come to value sleep and I try to make sure I don't short myself on it anymore, and frankly I think I'm much nicer and more usefully productive on less time awake than I was when sleep deprived constantly. But I never really have enough time or sleep, not so much that I can spend them freely. There's a bit of unsolicited life advice for anyone listening, get your rest, but in regard to our topic, I'm not sure you could ever have a feeling of abundance in terms of a quality like sleep or free time, and indeed too much free time can equate to boredom. So that's another example of how a total lack of scarcity, or even just abundance of a given want or need, isn't necessarily the benchmark for Utopia. We could rephrase that as a sufficiency of the trait, and again it's why we phrase it, on the show anyway, as being measured by people's anxiety about it rather than a specific quantity. Sleep, or lack thereof, is on my mind at the moment as I write this and get ready to go meet the three small children that my wife and I are planning to adopt and who will presumably have been living with us a couple of months by the time this episode airs. As I'm now recording this they've already come and stayed with us, and I'm grateful they sleep soundly thus far. And it also raised the notion of how desirable a post-scarcity life is, because we often recognize hardship and challenge as being character building, and that is one example of how a civilization might be capable of being post-scarcity on virtually all fronts, but intentionally avoid or be intentionally dissuaded from doing so in many cases, for fear of creating a spoiled and perpetually dissatisfied society. I think there's some validity to that but also that's a bit jingoistic. I don't think that having access to an abundant supply of warm running water, fit not just for drinking but long showers and baths, is going to wreck society, and the occasional camping trip or survival course can probably teach an appreciation for these things. Which is good because your ability to be grateful for something is enhanced by going without it occasionally, and I think life in general is a bit nicer with such appreciation in mind rather than always taking everything for granted. So there was a quick review of what post-scarcity is and some of its more obvious limitations and weaknesses, and reminders why it's also quite nice. Now let's proceed to discuss how we get there, and how that plan might fail. Truth be told that's not hard to imagine right now. As I write this in early November of 2022, nobody feels very post-scarcity after COVID-19, inflation, an energy crunch, and a major war going on in Eastern Europe. For the duration that I have been alive, the lifespan of the average human has been rising by about one year for every six that passed, but that has changed in the last few years, where it has stopped or maybe dropped a bit. I am pretty sure that hits all four horsemen of the apocalypse, famine, plague, war, and death. And while I'm noted for my optimism about the future, I'm guessing the state of affairs won't have changed before this airs in mid-January, except maybe to have gotten a bit worse. It is hard times and yet I do remain optimistic about the future in the long term and even the mid term. Nonetheless we have some real challenges and the biggest, especially in achieving abundance, is probably energy. I said when COVID hit that there was a good chance there would be the last true big pandemic humanity ever faced, and I think that's likely true, and I am hoping the energy crunch of this period will be remembered mostly as a final hurdle that forced us to buckle down and achieve long term energy abundance which highlights again that hardship can sometimes bring benefits, but against that we have to remember that the line between hardship, challenge, and brutal trauma can be rather blurry from a distance. So too, I think it's fairly straightforward to show that being post-scarcity does not mean an end to challenges. That seems especially true in the context of that being less a singular state than a bunch of wants and needs that a civilization might satisfy on a scale of 1 through 10, where 10 is maybe an idealized perfect state and post-scarcity is more like a 9, and something we already experience for information access, drinkable water, air to breathe, and a few others who are 9s or maybe 7s or 8s, and not all are simply material or physical needs. Things can also become post-scarcity and then unbecome them too, or be strictly local. For instance, a much more advanced civilization with a colony on the moon or Mars might still have a lot of anxiety about air to breathe, simply from that proximity to vacuum, even if it was perfectly sufficient for daily use, with lots of redundancies, 
and even if they were topping out several other post-scarcity categories, and at the same time doing well in some areas might make it easier to do well in others, an abundance of energy and education for instance is going to leave you pretty well positioned to work on other problems. Once more, we're justifying this definition of post-scarcity partially out the way it tends to be used to mean utopia anyway, so how abundantly and securely people's wants and needs are met seems a fairly legitimate standard. You probably would be able to move the needle up in a category without risking much to others while doing so, so it seems pretty hard to imagine not doing so politically as a leader or just at home in a family context as a parent even if on one side you have folks worried about spoiling people versus others arguing that any improvement that can be made should be made whether it spoils people or not. But what really makes us post-scarcity? Well, I've said on previous occasions that tipping points for our civilization would be more abundant and long-lasting energy supplies combined with superior automation and organization. I separate those last two because while computers are great for both, the ability to have a robotic factory supervised by a couple people that cranks out widgets at a rate that used to take a couple thousand people is different from one that's just very good at making sure we're not wasteful or inefficient in a bunch of tiny ways. Brute strength solutions to problems versus smart and targeted ones, only you can potentially have both. A civilization like ours could probably be post-scarcity in a general basic sense simply by cutting down on a lot of our waste and mismanagement. You could imagine preventing scenarios like placing a student in the wrong classroom for them when better observation and data would have put them in a classroom that they'd excel in. It's the difference between raw abundance or brute force and smart application of force Our real goal is to have both, and that's where artificial intelligence really has the potential to help us out. To be clear, this is not the classic image of humanoid robots with human-like intelligence waiting on us hand and foot. Rather, it's the notion that large amounts of relatively simple and diverse, narrow AI can be a massive augmentation and force multiplier to a person and to the workforce and civilization in general. Critical to this notion is that we're not even discussing human-level AGI, let alone superhuman, just things that might fall into the realm of somewhere between beasts of burden and power tools. Now it is entirely possible that in the next couple of decades we will be able to make human or even superhuman AI, but it is a mistake to assume a very subhuman AI is going to rapidly mutate into something like Skynet or a digital godling. That is on the table, too, for us to intentionally make, but I have problems seeing even its benevolent use being desirable. An AI looking to wipe us out or tell us what to do is bad, but even a kind one that you could think of as a caring big brother helping when you need it and constantly watching over you in case you need help is pretty creepy even without the Orwellian overtones. But our options are not an inevitable and binary choice of no AI or super AI, any more than that's the case with biological life. The options are not just inanimate objects or human intelligence. AI as a concept is a bit of a black box to most folks, as are computers themselves, and rather than going into that in detail in this episode, let us instead compare it to a robot vacuum cleaner or your dog. Your dog is way smarter than that robot, though not as good at cleaning the floor, except for when a tasty thing gets dropped in the kitchen or at the table. Neither is going to suddenly mutate into an invincible killing machine seeking to wipe out humanity. Indeed, given that your dog is directly descended from grey wolves, which probably used to occasionally attack and eat humans, and are still used in a guard capacity, you've gotten more to fear from dogs than dumb robots. We've all gotten scratched or bitten by our pets before, or hurt ourselves with a power tool, but while it encourages caution, we do not abandon having pets or power tools. Indeed, to stretch the analogy a bit further to contemplate human intelligent AI, We've all had to deal with toddlers or young kids before too, and the damage they did to us, themselves, someone else, or property. Foresight and management are needed, that's all. There are zero reasons why you would give your defense computer the ability to do anything other than recommend actions. There is zero reason why you would leave a bunch of automated drones or tanks on with full brain power when not actively engaged in combat. There is zero reason why they need any capacity for philosophy or resentment and no reason why they should magically acquire these, any more than a walk or be in a hive. I emphasize that because I said a moment ago that even a modest mix of better and renewable energy combined with better production automation and better smart logistics is the most obvious path to post-scarcity for us in the near future. If we decide we are ultra terrified of robots and simple AI, that might be a harder path to reach. 
tomorrow someone could pull off a production chain for solar panels, from resource extraction to installation and connection to a home, that managed to make those just 50% cheaper per kilowatt hour produced than today. That really isn't much of a leap, at least in comparison to the progress already made. At that point you don't necessarily even need electric cars, because we can make hydrocarbons, like the kind your car burns and which makes CO2 and water vapor in the process, by just reversing that, by the Sabatier process and this is carbon neutral gasoline at that point. All factors included, it takes about four times as much juice to make a gallon of gasoline as you get when burning it, but that only matters when there's a direct connection to cost. If you've got a 1000 watt solar panel that generally produces about 5 kilowatt hours a day, then in a 4 to 1 conversion ratio, it can produce a little over a gallon of gasoline a month, or 340 gallons over 25 years of operation. If that costs you a thousand bucks to install and maintain over that period, well you're paying three bucks a gallon for carbon neutral gasoline and it's at your home. Go a bit lower, a hundred bucks for a panel, and now you're filling your car's tank for a few bucks instead. Though in all probability if that were a home affair, you'd be using the excess energy from running your home power grid during peak hours to charge batteries for the evening and to make fuel, probably for a hybrid car running on batteries and hydrocarbons. Sounds great, and it could be. Production of methane or gasoline or even diesel made cheap, carbon neutral, and renewable for the next 4 billion years. Practically speaking though, pumping existing oil out of the ground is cheaper than maintaining a bunch of solar panels and associated machines to produce fuel. I cannot imagine how that could actually change either. Last I heard it generally cost 10 or 12 bucks a barrel to produce oil in the Middle East, depending on the country and other details or about a quarter for a gallon of raw crude oil, it's more than double that in the US with the difference in labor costs and such, but automation that improves solar power production probably improves oil pumping too. However, what it costs to pump the stuff is not what it costs to buy the stuff at the gas station, obviously, when the cost is scaling up 1000% to 3000% on its way from the oil barrel through refineries and shipping and taxing to your car. So it is possible to make gasoline from solar power cheaper than it is at the pump, right now, with only slightly better solar, but at the same time I have to assume all those improvements could help existing fossil fuel production, and more importantly the producers can just cut the cost in a number of ways. It is entirely possible that automation might make it only cost $5 a barrel to pump, and at that point it's still worth doing if you can only sell it for $6, indeed that's a nice 20% profit margin there. Why that's relevant is that I could easily imagine prices seesawing around, and also that I do expect us to inevitably pump every last drop of readily available hydrocarbons, so sequestering technology is still a plus. Without jumping into geopolitics, I can think of some obvious motivations and strategies for screen with the costs to make the development of that much slower and bumpier. So we might see a cool new widget come out that lets you make a few gallons of gas a week at your home in your own personal tank for around what gas costs now, then see the price drop on it below that. Things like that could apply to a lot of other techs and wants and needs humanity has, and, in that way, interfering with how these methods or technologies develop could be seen as preventing or delaying post-scarcity on it. A rebuttal would probably be that in the end, a price war on ever cheaper energy is merely delaying that, not preventing it, and furthermore one could argue it gives those places that are supplying the fuel all the resources, motivation, and time they could reasonably need to develop into other economic sectors. This episode isn't about why solar is cool, we've pitched the same line of reasoning about nuclear fission and fusion before too, same with batteries or molten salts over artificially synthesized chemical fuels. It's the notion that an existing supplier of a want or need isn't really motivated to assist in their own replacement, and that it honestly isn't that hard to push back at a new technology to make folks nervous about it, nuclear being one example, and automation artificial intelligence being two others. Such being the case, I could see post-scarcity languishing out of reach. Once more, we must remember this isn't just a single category and we specifically say energy abundance and better automation make us post scarcity because it lets us manage so many of those basic needs. Maslow's hierarchy, which has its pros and cons as a model, but again works for today's discussion, has a pyramid of needs going up from physiological ones like air, food, sleep, and water, through to safety needs above physiological, then love and belonging needs like friendship, then esteem, then self-actualization. 
Nobody really debates that basic structure of needs, but some models have more levels and move certain things around, like reproduction is down in physiological needs while intimacy is up in love and belonging. But unlike air and water and food, you can go indefinitely without personally reproducing, whereas lack of intimacy or friendship can be way worse on the individual and pretty bad even in the relatively short term. We are obviously using the framework of the hierarchy in our discussion of post-scarcity, those basic lower level needs still needing to be met, but what goes where and gets labeled which doesn't matter to us, rather it's a checklist, some which are more basic and higher priority. That means a post-scarcity civilization would need to provide for those higher level needs like respect and status and love in order for it to truly be post-scarcity, and this is a good place to emphasize that such a civilization does not have to have all needs being something state provided. People who might pay a lot of money voluntarily to use a dating service whose AI is amazingly good at matching you to your soulmate might be horrified at the government having a dating service even if it was entirely voluntary. As usual on the show, for neutrality's sake we don't really care where the food on people's table came from, nor how they got the friends and family sharing it with them, capitalist, socialist, communist, anarchist, free citizens or super tyrant etc. Just that we would like that abundance and the technology that provides the option, or sometimes a facsimile of the option. Generally speaking, if you've got an abundance of fuel for the system, be that energy or food or robots or all of the above, you're very well positioned to address many of the others. So let's close by discussing a number of non-obvious wants and needs and some technological options for satisfying them as well as some potential implications or complications. For instance, this show is family friendly so we don't dwell on the uses of virtual reality or human passable androids for satisfying human intimacy needs, even for those whose appearance or personality makes that challenging for them. I'm sure everyone can fill in the blanks on that, and your mileage may vary from revulsion to humor and many points in between. Leaving that specific bit aside, virtual reality does give us the option to run our own kingdom or be the boss. And if it were well simulated, it might actually produce good leaders and team players rather than a billion petty tyrants or adolescent fantasies. I also expect most folks would find real power or leadership terribly disappointing, at least if it was realistic. There's an episode of Rick and Morty where they have a sliding realism control on a video game and find out how tedious and boring saying the realism to high really is, especially for exploring asteroid belts and deep space. Virtual reality itself was a technology that never lived up to the hype it got in the 1990s, though it has finally seen some real advancement more than a generation later, but in between we've got the internet and smartphone apps and social media. Most of us have seen a few jumped levels of technology in our lifetimes that have been met with fears of abuse or addiction, particularly with video games, the internet, and social media, and for my own part I think those fears were not baseless, but also often overhyped and for some more than others. The simpler answer then is, we do not know yet how VR or some other awesome new technology that might help with more social needs might affect society in a practical sense, or how it might be perceived which matters just as much. Folks might decide that as awesome as online simulated worlds are for letting folks experiencing being a comic book hero or world leader or rock star, the perceived cost is too high and they bust the devices up or even prevent their deployment beyond a certain point. And if half your population lives all day in VR and the other half doesn't or mostly doesn't, the latter is in a better position to dictate what's going on in the real world since it's where they're spending their time. VR and simulation is usually the big one for satisfying higher needs, and my guess is that we will achieve a happy medium that permits utilizing these in a mostly helpful way, but it's also not the only option. And I do like options. Before COVID I used to say that one of the things I most loved about my civilization was that I could go to Walmart at 3 in the morning and choose from a hundred different types of cereal, and it didn't matter that I would get the same one I always do, I had that option and it was my analogy for where I thought civilization should generally be aiming when it came to needs and services. I find it darkly amusing that among all the rough patches we've all endured in the last few years, the end of an abundance of all-night big box stores and returning to having operating hours more like they were when I was a kid is what offends and bugs me the most. Space colonization is another of those options for people to achieve an outlet for creativity and forging new worlds that VR might otherwise solve. 
and I don't think that one existing prevents the other either. Similarly, simply being baseline post-scarcity with an abundance of food and air and water and shelter mostly solves the entire second tier need of safety and security of your body, employment, resources, family, and property. You're just not really needing to worry that you or your family might starve to death next year or live in a hovel, but abundance doesn't remove fears of the body declining or growing ill. Having a billion dollars won't save you from cancer, as Steve Jobs or Paul Allen or a host of others demonstrate, but it does let you fund a lot of R&D for treatment and offer a lot of better palliative care than most humans historically got. Nonetheless, there is no guarantee we will get real fixes for some categories of potential post-scarcity. That's not simply disease either, which science is likely to cure the majority of, if not all, given time, but that desire for friendship or talent may never be truly realized for all. Here too we might have artificial intelligence on social media to help guide us to those most likely to share our interests and have complementary personalities to befriend. We may get educational technologies that make it far easier to learn skills, so that anyone can be a virtuoso or master craftsman, though if everyone is awesome, some might argue no one is. Consider self-esteem, which itself is a trait or concept that is hard to define and is disputed even among psychologists. While it is about ourselves, it tends to be heavily influenced by the world around us, and thus might be influenced by existence in a virtual world, or helping to terraform and build some new world far from Earth, and many might wonder if the former might be inherently less satisfying than the latter. We joked earlier about post-discontent societies, ones where people lived in slums but felt great about it, but that's specifically the notion of some civilization drugging or brainwashing its people into submission. We discussed that more in its own episode, but our dismissal of post-discontent tricks as not being true post-scarcity does not really address or invalidate the idea of careful and expert use of antidepressants for instance, or people being taught to rise above the strictly material and be far more aesthetic. The line is gray between over-medication and healthy use of medication, as is the line between teaching and indoctrination. However, I think a part of reaching post-scarcity is essentially not to cross that line, in favor of helping people to stop craving some things or do so in a more healthy fashion. Which is better, for someone who grew up afraid of where the next meals will come from to have a basement full of can of goods and packed freezers, or, as a result of a sturdy supply chain, for them to have confidence that a much smaller personal supply was sufficient, and for that to be a justified confidence rather than a false one. This is more of the notion expressed in the Roddenberry ideal on display in Star Trek, where they also had replicators to make any basic need and fusion reactors to power them. Post-scarcity in Trek was often poorly written or expressed, but at least as a basic concept it held that mankind would rise above the selfish and materialistic to focus on higher ideals and cooperation, and that material abundance would aid this in many ways often by simply preventing children from having those deprivations or anxieties during their formative phases that can develop into excesses. And that's not just the notion of acquiring things for things sake, but also maturing to not need lots of praise from others or to be the nicest dressed or best looking or smartest person in the room and so on, and obviously that is one of those hard to express and debatable things, since most of us approve of healthy ambition and drive and which particular expressions and outlets for that we think are okay or even admirable versus those we detest is often pretty subjective. For instance, I am obviously very driven and if you home in on what my own biggest ambition is, it is to build worlds, but fundamentally merely those as the great stages on which civilizations may arise and fulfilling and long lives be held. I'd imagine many folks, especially my own audience, would nod their head approvingly at that goal but it also isn't exactly humble, and certainly demands way more resources than someone whose ambition is to live in a house made out of gold or have the most attractive body, both of which we might roll our eyes at. Generally, the notion of abundance from post-scarcity is that such ambitions are still okay, go have your solid gold house, but there's obviously lines that can't be crossed and trying to figure out what those will be and who gets to determine that is going to be nearly as big a challenge as getting to the abundant state of post-scarcity. 
And the closing thought is that it will also be a challenge to maintain post-scarcity not just to get it, as we live in a finite universe in space and time and resources, we may well find that we reach basic post-scarcity in a few more decades, and golden age things for several centuries as our automation allows rapid rise in culture shift status while our population growth trails way behind. So too as many of these states of post-scarcity can be contested, both in how it is acceptable or genuine to satisfy them, or in negative side effects on civilization of doing so, there might be a lot of efforts to knock a given bit of post-scarcity down. Indeed I'd imagine one of the most common preoccupations in a modestly post-scarcity civilization would be talking or arguing over how to improve our score in some category, or why we need to change how we do it or stop doing it, or how to ensure we maintain the state longer or more stably. One thing we don't lack at this time is plenty of folks debating ways to improve society or wreck it, and as we've seen today, we're not likely to ever run short on our supply of that, whether we're post-scarcity or not. The future will not lack challenges or be boring, that I'm pretty confident about. Still I'd much rather we tackle those with plenty of resources on hand and be able to enjoy ourselves while we're at it. And I think that's the future we are likely to see, and its basic beginnings might not be too far away, maybe even already here in many ways. Things may be hard now, but they were far harder in the not so distant past, and my forecast is that grey skies are gonna clear up and even better days are ahead. So as we saw today, most of the paths to a brighter post-scarcity future do rely on us becoming ever better with our math, science, and computer science, and it is already very important to have those skills and will only grow more so as time goes on. To navigate the modern world and not fall behind, you need STEM skills, and our friends over at Brilliant can help you get better at everything from personal finance, to career goals, to understanding world-changing tech like AI and neural networks. Brilliant's visual, interactive approach is engaging and makes STEM concepts actually stick, with helpful explanations along the way that never leave you guessing. Brilliant focuses on interactive and hands-on learning and breaking big important concepts down to understandable and interactive pieces like they do in their Intro to Algebra lessons, or Intro to Probability. The best way to learn math, science, and computer science is by interactive problem solving. With thousands of lessons and more being added each month, Brilliant can help you reach your goals. In just 15 minutes a day, with bite-sized lessons, you can master topics that you once thought impossible, be it the basics like fractions or advanced topics like calculus, learn the core concepts so you can help pioneer new innovations. With Brilliant, you can learn at your own pace, learn on the go, and learn a little something new every day. To get started for free, visit Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or click on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So that's it for today, but this weekend we'll have our mid-month Sci-Fi Sunday episode examining the possibility we live in a hostile galaxy and some of the Fermi Paradox solutions discussing that, like Dark Force Theory and Berserker Probes. Then next week we'll explore both the Big Crunch Cosmological Model and the Omega Point, along with options for eternal intelligence. Then in two weeks we'll be looking at the possibility of using asteroids as spaceships, both interplanetary and interstellar. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula at nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.